We begin today in Syria, where the United Nations is warning nearly one million Syrians are living under siege, double the number last year. The vast majority, 850,000 people, are being blockaded by the Syrian government. On Monday, the UN Human Rights Agency said civilians trapped in eastern Aleppo, where the last hospitals have been destroyed by Syrian government bombing, are facing annihilation. On Tuesday, the UN spokesperson Rupert Colville said the attacks on hospitals, if proven deliberate and as part of a systematic pattern, could amount to war crimes. The situation in eastern Aleppo is really so horrendous. I mean, it's beyond words. I think we're all struggling to, to say anything new about it because it's so unremittingly awful, despite the occasional let ups. Uh, overall, the picture is horrendous, and the fact that these hospitals and clinics have continu continuously been hit uh, is a matter of very, very grave concern. The World Health Organization says the Syrian government's intense bombing campaign against eastern Aleppo has damaged and shut down the area's only remaining hospitals, leaving 250,000 people trapped without access to medical care. Doctors warn the damaged hospitals may not be able to reopen. This comes as Syrian government forces have surrounded eastern Aleppo, which is rapidly running out of food, fuel and water. Meanwhile, on Sunday, the government of Bashar al-Assad said it had rejected a proposal by the UN Special Envoy for Syria, which called for eastern Aleppo to be granted autonomy if jihadist fighters linked to al-Qaeda withdrew and the fighting stopped. Well, for more, we're joined by two guests. In Chicago, Dr. Zahir Sahlul is founder of the American Relief Coalition for Syria and senior advisor and former president of the Syrian American Medical Society. He's visited Aleppo five times since the war began. He was a classmate of Bashar al-Assad in medical school. And in Washington, D.C., Bassam Haddad is director of the Middle East and Islamic Studies program at George Mason University. He's co-founder of Jadalia and director of the Arab Studies. Institute. He wrote a piece for The Nation last month headlined, The Debate Over Syria Has Reached a Dead End. He's also the author of Business Networks in Syria, The Political Economy of Authoritarian Resilience. Welcome back uh, to both of you uh, to Democracy Now! Dr. Zahir Sahlul, I'd like to begin with you uh, to go over what we said in our introduction, namely the state of hospitals in eastern Aleppo. Uh, according to the World Health Organization, there are no functioning hospitals left in East Aleppo. And you were last on the show in August when you said the situation in Aleppo was, quote, 10 times worse than hell. Could you tell us what you know uh, of the situation? situation in uh, East Aleppo today, and in particular, the state of medical facilities? It's even worse than last time. Um, and really, words at this point do not mean anything. Um, uh, the use of uh, catastrophic or beyond description do not mean anything, because uh, we're talking about a city that has 300,000 people, among them 100,000 children, who are trapped with no food or medicine for the past four months and a half. And everyone is watching them with indifference. That's at least what they perceive. Um, so we're talking about all hospitals in Aleppo right now that have capacity to treat victims of bombing uh, that are destroyed, including the hospital that I spent last medical mission in with my colleagues. Uh, that was a M10 hospital. It was a hospital underground for protection of doctors and nurses. And it was completely destroyed. That hospital used to perform 4,000 4, surgeries, life-saving surgeries, every year. Uh, in the last two days, uh, two more hospitals were destroyed, uh, which are the largest hospitals that are doing surgeries and uh, taking the trauma patients. Every day, there are massacres. And right now, the space for treating these patients is shrinking. In addition to the shortage of the medicine, um, IV fluid, antibiotics, pain medicine, suture sets, and, of course, the shortage of uh, doctors. Every 17 hours right now in Aleppo, there is a targeting of healthcare facility. Every 60 hours, there is a targeting and killing of a healthcare worker. In the last 144 days, there were 143 attacks on healthcare facilities in Syria, committed by the Syrian government and its ally, mostly Russia, and one third of them happened in the city of Aleppo. So, right now, to be a medical worker in Syria is the most dangerous. Uh, job uh, in, on, on earth. Uh, and in spite of that, we have doctors and nurses in Syria, and Aleppo especially, who want to continue to save their lives, but they need to be protected.
So, Dr. Sahlul, could you say, then, uh, where people are going now? You're in touch with medical uh, personnel in uh, East Aleppo. Where are people going now to seek medical treatment? There are still small medical facilities that are open and treating patients. Uh, they're semi-destroyed or partially destroyed. Um, there are some basements of buildings that our doctors are, um, you know, treating their patients. Um, when I was in Aleppo, I visited seven medical facilities. These are hospitals that were uh, in Aleppo before the crisis. And so few of them are very small, and they do not have the capacity to treat uh, victims of trauma or victims of chemical weapons, as we, are, we were seeing in the last few days. But in spite of that, uh, they are opening some of their spaces that are not destroyed to keep accommodating the, accommodating the patients. Um, you know, health care is um, one essential part that keeps a city going. And if you destroy every facility or medical facility, that means you are destroying the neighborhoods, you are destroying the city. And that's why it's very crucial to keep anything that will keep uh, providing medical care to the, to the uh, civilians in the city uh, available. I'd like to bring in uh, uh, Professor uh, Bassam Haddad, uh, director of the Middle East and Islamic Studies program at George Mason University, and also co-founder of uh, Jadalia. Uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Haddad, uh, on this site, uh, Jadalia, which you co-founded, you and your colleagues have been documenting uh, uh, developments in Aleppo. And you point out uh, on the site that, in addition to the carnage in East Aleppo, there have been repeated attacks on the government-controlled side uh, of Aleppo, West Aleppo. What do you know of the scale of these attacks and who's carrying them out? Thanks, uh, Nermeen. Well, uh, clearly, there's been uh, uh, slamming of Western Aleppo by the rebels. And uh, the issue here, or the uh, uh, point here, is that these, uh, of course, pale in comparison to the a brutal bombardment of uh, eastern Aleppo and the almost total destruction of life. Uh, the issue is not necessarily uh, one to create any kind of parity, but uh, it reveals a uh, lack of reporting in Western media about uh, that kind of uh, direction of shelling uh, into western Aleppo. But the more a uh, significant point, as, as uh, uh, my uh, uh, co-panelist, if you will, has just shared, is that what we are witnessing in Aleppo today, and especially in East Aleppo, of course, is nothing short of a slaughter. And that is, unfortunately, uh, when I was here three weeks ago on this show, I had discussed that we had not, had not seen then anything yet compared to what is likely to happen. And I fear that this will continue, this viciousness will continue until the regime and Russia uh, take over eastern Aleppo, because it is uh, considered a necessary step uh, to prop up their position in any future negotiation before, during or after the uh, takeover or the uh, uh, Trump administration comes uh, into effect. And that is a chilling uh, prospect, given what needs to happen in order for Aleppo to fall. The rebels will not give up. The regime and the Russians will go to any length to not just uh, uh, take over, but the, the idea here is to destroy uh, life in itself. And we see that uh, with the targeting of hospitals that cannot be but uh, deliberate uh, in, in this situation. Uh, Professor Haddad, could you say a little more about what you uh, expect will happen, given uh, the intransigence uh, of the regime and other parties involved? What do you think will happen in East Aleppo? Uh, I, you know, I, uh, w w I mean, it's uh, as as my uh, colleague said, uh, we are all in a loss for words. I mean, there's nothing that could describe what actually might happen if this uh, onslaught continues. But at a uh, strategic level, the Syrian regime and the Russians will not stop until this, it seems, that they will not stop until eastern Aleppo is within uh, their uh, control. And it is important to note that the regime and Russia today have overlapping interest in doing so. However, it is also important to recognize that there might be a rift after that point. 
because the degree to which they both want to conquer all of Aleppo uh, is very similar. But in any future process, uh, it seems like Russia is much more interested uh, in focusing on stability and some sort of control of the situation in Syria, whereas the regime is mostly interested in reconquering the entirety of Syria and reestablishing uh, itself and certainly its survival. And that might actually open the door for some negotiation. But I fear that if this is the case, if uh, the entirety of Aleppo is captured, it will leave, uh, in any uh, scenario, very, very little room for uh, negotiation at a time when no international power, and certainly the U.S., neither have the will or the interest in doing very much to stop this. So there is this theater that people are asking the United States to intervene and to do more. But in reality, neither is there a will, nor is there any kind of desire to uh, stop this process. And it seems that there is a consensus, not just against the revolution, as people say. People are always concerned about the revolution. But there is a consensus against the well-being of Syria and Syrian, with uh, and Syrians, with or without the revolution or the regime, for purposes that are mostly geopolitical. Because, as we know, before 2011, all the parties that supposedly today are uh, trying to uh, defend Syria or fight for Syria or help the revolution in Syria were supporting the Syrian regime, from the Arab Gulf states to the United States at various times. Well, before we talk about the role uh, of the U.S. in Syria, I'd like to ask uh, Dr. Sahloul uh, about comments that some have made that groups like al-Nusra and other uh, extreme uh, Islamist groups uh, operating in East Aleppo are keeping people hostage uh, and using them as human shields in East Aleppo. Uh, some There have been reports that people in East Aleppo uh, fear uh, leaving for the western part of the city because they're likely to be detained there as terrorists. Uh, Dr. Sahlul, could you comment on that and, and what you you know uh, of the situation of people uh, attempting to flee East Aleppo? Uh, when I was in Aleppo in the last uh, medical mission, uh, just before the siege uh, became a reality, uh, I was there with two uh, physicians from Chicago, Dr. John Kaler and Dr. Sam al -Attar. Uh, We frankly did not see al-Nusra. We visited all hospitals in Aleppo. And it's dangerous for me, as a, an American doctor, to be in a situation where you have encounter with these terrorists. Uh, but we have not seen any signs for them, at least in the neighborhoods and the hospitals we visited. Now, there might be few fighters of al-Nusra in the city of Aleppo and around it, but that's not what is keeping the people in. Let's not forget that uh, the population of eastern Aleppo was 1.5 million uh, before the crisis, and right now it's 300,000. That means uh, the 1.2 million are already refugees or internally displaced somewhere in Turkey, in Europe, or in the rest of Syria. Um, the 300,000 people are there because they don't have any other place to go. Even if they wanted to leave, where would they go? Uh, Turkey has sealed the border completely. Uh, any other place in Syria is dangerous, because the Russians and the Syrians have been bombing Idlib, for example, which is nearby. They cannot go to government-controlled areas, because they can be tortured and detained. And, uh, of course, that happened uh, frequently. Previously, in other places, they were put under siege. And if they are let go, that's called ethnic cleansing, forced evacuation, according to the United Nations. It happened in Daraya, it happened in Maddamiya, it happened in Zabadani, it happened in the old city of Homs. And right now we are witnessing uh, what's uh, be becoming the next ethnic cleansing or forced evacuation in Syria. Um, there might be some terrorist group or al-Nusra around Aleppo, but that's not what's keeping the people in. Um, and what's keeping the people in, that they have no other place to go, and they are also trapped. They cannot go to any place that is safe. And, Professor Bassam Haddad, uh, to return to the, the point that you raised uh, about U.S. involvement uh, in Syria, I'd like to quote from an interview uh, with the Syrian writer and political dissident Yasin al-Hajj Saleh. You pointed out that the U.S. has been supporting rebel groups in Syria, as, of course, they have. But he says in this interview with The Intercept, quote, in many important ways, the Americans have been supporting Bashar al-Assad. 
Assad. The United States helped create a situation, he says, in which Syria would be plunged into chaos, but the regime would remain in power. So could you respond to that and also give us a sense of what U.S. policy vis-à-vis uh, -vis Syria has been from the start uh, of the uprising in 2011 uh, to the present day? Uh, yes. I Well, first, uh, I uh, respect the uh, perseverance of Yassin al-Hajj Saleh uh, as a dissident who was imprisoned by uh, the Syrian regime and suffered the structural brutality for 16 years uh, by the Syrian regime. And I support the idea that uh, the U.S. intervention has been anything but positive uh, from the very beginning. And, uh, you know, the, I, as I shared earlier, I mean, this has been, uh, uh, in my view, quite obvious. It's just that I also wish, uh, uh, based on the quote that you gave me, I, I wish that Yassin al-Hajj Saleh has uh, or had thought about this or provided it as an advice early on to the revolutionaries when they were tripping over themselves here next door down the street in Washington, D.C., to cozy up to uh, U.S. policy makers in trying to move things in a particular direction, when in reality this was basically a moot point, considering exactly what Yassin al-Hajj Saleh is saying right now. So in my view, that is not a controversial point. And the idea here is to move beyond uh, this uh, call for U.S. intervention and think about what is the real interest of Syrians, because everybody's bypassing the interests of Syrians. In fact, as a result of this kind of uh, support uh, by people like Yassin al Saleh for a more critical view, we are beginning to see a rift, if you will, between uh, think tank analysts uh, within the U.S. Uh, supportive of a traditional establishment approach that uh, seeks to secure, first and foremost, the security of Israel, we're, becoming to, we're be be beginning to see a rift between this group of supporters of the Syrian revolution and many Syrians who support the Syrian uprising and revolution, whereby the former group is much more interested in uh, the outcomes of the revolution in relation to Iran's domination of the region or control and Israel's security, whereas the uh, revolutionaries are much more interested in the well-being of Syrians. And this rift actually can be, uh, can be uh, viewed by looking at how think tank analysts today are scrambling to oppose a Trump policy on the basis of not the Syrian people, not the uh, health of the Syrian uprising, but on how it might produce positive effects. That is, Trump's policy might produce a positive effect for Iran, Syria, and their allies, including Hezbollah in the region, and how it would threaten Israel. This line of argument reveals from the uh, reveals what has been the concern and the worry from the beginning of that kind of uh, trajectory. And this is actually what we are witnessing today, and that quote is apt, a, a rift that should have existed from the very beginning for the sake of building a healthier, independent and democratic uprising in Syria against a dictatorial regime. And Dr. Sahloul, very quickly before we conclude, uh, the Syrian president Bashar al-Assad commented for the first time on Trump's electoral victory last week, calling him, quote, a natural ally of his regime. So could you very quickly tell us what you expect from a Trump presidency vis-à-vis uh, -vis Syria? Uh, before that, uh, we're calling for a day of solidarity with the doctors and nurses in Syria uh, on Friday. Uh, where everyone should uh, put a hashtag that never again is now uh, to support medical medics in Syria. Uh, and this is something that is very important, because committing war crimes against doctors and nurses is, um, should be rejected by everyone. It should not be normalized. What now, Trump has said that he will be support uh, President Assad. What kept the people in Syria hopeful of the future, the fact that there will be one day that will, they will have the same liberties and freedom that we have and enjoy in this country. And if this is removed, if Trump will be supportive of Assad and Assad will control the rest of Syria and uh, he will declare victory and he will continue to be a president for the next 14 years, as he uh, has promised, then that will be the, really the last nail in the coffin 
of the aspiration of the Syrian people, the young people of Syria, who rise, rose up in the beginning of this um, uh, five years ago uh, for freedoms and liberties that we enjoy and we all support. Well, I want to thank you both uh, uh, for joining us, Dr. Zahir Sahalul, founder of the American Relief Coalition for Syria and senior, senior advisor and former president of the Syrian American Medical Society. He's visited Aleppo five times since the war began and was a classmate of Bashar al-Assad. Uh, Bassam Haddad is director of the Middle East and Islamic Studies program. Thank you so much uh, uh, for joining us. He's also associate professor at the Shah School for Policy and Government at George Mason University, co-founder of Jadaliya and director of the Arab Studies Institute. He wrote a piece for The Nation last month headlined, The Debate Over Syria Has Reached a Dead End.